I was diagnosed with a soft tissue sarcoma in 1999. It was discovered by accident, uh, what is known today as a whoops operation. The surgeon did no diagnostic work at all other than a clinical examination and then a few days later he stuck the knife into it and immediately knew he had done something wrong. Um, I was referred then to a specialist and about six weeks later I had definitive surgery. Uh, nine months later I had a recurrence which um, is not the nicest place to be. I had surgery for that, it was lymph nodes uh, in the groin and then about three months later I had a further recurrence in the same area, another tumour, which the medical team decided was unreceptable. And there were few choices available then, remember this is only the year 2000. I did have one important choice though, and that was to be able to go on to a clinical trial. Uh, to everyone's amazement, uh, I responded. Uh, I showed a response after, on a scan after two cycles, and the response continued, and I had a complete remission. Well now we're nine years further on, and the humbling thought is that I could quite possibly be the only survivor. Uh, we don't know for certain because of course it's impossible. Uh, to look up all the other patients. This period of remission lasted seven years. Uh, I thought I'd beaten it and although I was followed up very closely by uh, the oncology team at the Christie Hospital, I said, you know, I seriously thought um, it would never be another problem. And then I felt something strange down on my lower leg where the original tumour had been and eventually this was diagnosed as a field of new tumours. The agonising decision I had to take was to choose between two different surgical routes. One was an amputation and the other was limb saving surgery but it would have left me with a disability uh, in, the, in the leg because the muscle would, so much muscle would have been removed. I finally decided to have the amputation uh, not the easiest of decisions, but one that I haven't actually uh, regretted as I've recovered well from that and mobility and, the, and of course the lower leg has never been a problem since because everything has gone. <laughs> now patient organisations are there to, to, to bring people together. Uh, that's, what, that's what we're about and that's what we should be encouraged to doing. The, uh, we have this objective, all of us, of wanting to treat patients better. It's a, it's a common objective. Let's recognise that, let's build around it. So we need relationships with everyone if we're to do that. And that's our primary interest. We need to influence the pharmaceutical industry, but we also need to influ influence uh, regulators, policy makers, and the funders in particular of, uh, of treatment. At Sarcoma UK, one of our most important contributions uh, in the regulatory world was over the nice appraisal of trebectatin in 2009. Our intervention at the appraisal committee uh, changed what happened or what could have happened. We made them understand that the quality of life model that they had elected to use was inappropriate, that it did not reflect the quality of life that sarcoma patients experienced, even in advanced disease. The result was they adopted a different model and it produced a more favourable um, co cost effectiveness ratio, an ICER, I think they call it. And it was then down to Pharmamar and Pharmamar's brave decision to take quite a radical approach to pricing the drug uh, that got, got trebectadine licensed or approved for use in the NHS in England. But I think these two stories, the story of trebectadine and the story of MEPACT, just show how a patient group and patients being prepared to be active in support of what they believe in can make a difference to regulators.
there are many lessons in how we got to this point but for me perhaps the most important one is that of having a plan even if you can't always keep to it you still have a plan but be patient be patient and things will happen to support you.